Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. Annie Laurie and I are co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. On today's show, we'll be joined by sociologist Samuel Perry. He's an expert on Christian nationalism and author of the new book, The Flag and the Cross, White Christian Nationalism and the Threat to American Democracy. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. Samuel Perry is an award-winning assistant professor of sociology and religious studies at the University of Oklahoma. He's a leading expert on Christian nationalism. His books include Taking America Back for God, with co-author Andrew Whitehead, and his new book, The Flag and the Cross, White Christian Nationalism and the Threat to American Democracy, was co-authored with Philip Gorski. We're also delighted that Samuel Perry contributed a chapter to the significant report on Christian nationalism at the January 6th insurrection released earlier this year by the Freedom From Religion Foundation and the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Freedom. Before we welcome Samuel Perry to the show, let's begin with this quote from his book. He writes, Until the insurrection, white Christian nationalism was invisible to most Americans. It was invisible to most conservative white Christians because for decades, it has been the water they swim in and the air they breathe. It was invisible to most secular progressives because they live in a bubble of their own in which white Christian nationalism seems fringe rather than mainstream. Here to talk more about this dangerous threat to our democratic republic is Professor Samuel Perry. Welcome back to Free Thought Matters. Thank you so much for having me. So in the beginning of your excellent book here, The Flag and the Cross, you, you describe the Capitol insurrection that happened on January 6th as being like the eruption of a volcano, the culmination of a buildup for years of white Christian nationalism. Can you explain that? Sure. One of the things that we wanted to, one of the points that we wanted to drive home in our, our book, especially on the outset, is that there's this common misconception, especially after the events at the Capitol. We all watched on TV. We all saw these. We've, we've seen the video footage. We've seen the photos of uh, the violence, but also the, the Jesus save signs and the Christian flags and the impromptu worship sessions and even the, a prayer in Jesus's name in the Senate chamber. And I think, unfortunately, I think it was it was quickly that kind of symbolism, that kind of ideology that we witnessed on display was was marginalized as something that is not mainstream, as something that is radical or it is fringe. And we'd agree that yes, that is a, a radical instance or instantiation of, of that kind of like ideology. And yet we wanted to argue that the underlying ideology beneath the capital insurrection and the, the kind of forces that we saw uh, buying into the big lie, buying into anti-democratic uh, trends over the past few years is not fringe and is actually something that is alarmingly mainstream. That is white Christian nationalism. So what we're trying to do in that in that initial chapter is we're we're really trying to 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 help Americans understand that even when we see these very, very radical instances of Christian nationalism erupt into violence, it really is reflecting something far more pervasive beneath the surface. And that's what we really need to target. So during the uh, hearings this last summer on the January 6th insurrection, 
We actually didn't hear much about Christian nationalism, although one of the members of that select committee, Jamie Raskin, says he thinks it was sort of the default underpinning to all of that. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I, mean, I think broadly understood, white Christian nationalism, uh, I think, is an, is an ideology that, that places uh, religious rhetoric and feeling behind this perception that America rightfully belongs to people like us. And when I say people like us, I mean white, ethnically, if not racially, con traditional or conservative, uh, Christian or even pro-Christian. Like, you actually don't necessarily need to identify as a Christian to really embrace white Christian nationalism. You just, it just is almost an ethnic category at that point. But these are Americans who believe the country belongs to, it was founded by people like us, it belongs to people like us, and we need to take back our country for people like us. And it's been stolen by the left, by the socialists, by the, the tyrants and the communists and the globalists, like the QAnon shaman says in that, in that famous uh, prayer. Uh, and so absolutely, I would say white Christian nationalism is really the, the, the undercurrent of that kind of um, of the kind of capital violence that we saw, because it, it is it is primarily motivated by the idea that that America is being stolen from us, and outsiders, uh, ideological, cultural, ethnic, political outsiders, are taking what is rightfully ours, and thus we are justified uh, with violence, if necessary, and certainly with anti-democratic tactics to take back our country. Do Christian nationalists actually believe that our country was founded as a Christian nation? Uh, absolutely. So this is this is actually one of the, the the primary elements of Christian nationalist ideology. In our in our book, The Flag and the Cross, what we do is we talk about how Christian nationalism is made up of both a a, a deep story of America's past and a vision for its future. So uh, the vision or the deep story about America's past is that America was founded as a Christian nation by Christians for Christ, primarily a Christian uh, group, and that. That was a, a key aspect of, of us growing prosperous as a nation, our Christian foundations, our biblical principles, or those kinds of things. There is also a vision for what America is supposed to look like in the future. And we, as Christian nationalists or white Americans who subscribe to this kind of idea, we need to take our country and form it uh, into this really conception of, of, of uh, uh, our ideal standard in which people like us, our culture, our traditions are... Uh, placed back in positions of power. Now, this is kind of an interesting finding that we we talk about in the book, though. Uh, Christian nationalist ideology, uh, Christian nationalist beliefs, as we measure them, and we can talk about that in a second, we find that that is powerfully associated with, uh, with incorrect understandings of American history. Uh, we found that white Americans, especially, who subscribe to Christian nationalist ideology are more likely to believe uh, things that are just flat out not true about, say, the Constitution, that, uh, that the First Amendment allows Congress to, uh, to to not restrict religion, but Christianity could be established as the religion of the country, or that uh, or that the Supreme Court had completely banned prayer from public schools rather than just limiting uh, teacher-led prayer, or uh, or that the Constitution mentions mentions our our country's obligations to God several times, and which of course it does not. You know, so it's it's that kind of thing. We find that Christian nationalist ideology leads Americans to embrace an, a a. a fundamentally incorrect view of America's history so that they can promote this kind of uh, this this kind of vision for for what America is supposed to be like and how they're going to remake it. Well, it's certainly been the prevailing myth that we at the Freedom from Religion Foundation have had to try to um, fight this idea that America is a Christian nation. But Christian nation, uh, Christian nationalism is a little bit more than that, isn't it? I mean, do you could you give a clear definition of that for viewers who may not be familiar? with this sure, term, absolutely. Christian nationalism, how you would define it? Absolutely. And I think that's really important to define it, because I, I think one of the things that we're trying to push back against now is, and, and I think to some degree it's a fair criticism when buzzwords like this become com kind of common vernacular. People are talking about Christian nationalism. I think within, uh, uh, you know, recently on, on social media, Christian nationalism became a, a trending topic for several days. And uh, means that people are talking about it, people are throwing around the language. And when that happens, oftentimes definitions can get fuzzy and you end up calling a bunch of things Christian nationalism that may not be. And so uh, what we try to do is we try to carefully define a Christian nationalism as an ideology that idealizes and advocates for a fusion of American civic life with a very particular kind of Christianity. Um, and and so it's an, it's a, it, it likes to idealize it. It has this sacred myth, this kind of belief that this has always been the case, but it has this uh, it wants to advocate for that 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 vision of what a, what America is supposed to be like. But the key part of that definition is a fusion of American civic life with a very particular kind of Christianity. 
what we mean there, it, we don't necessarily mean somebody who adheres to, say, like traditional Orthodox creeds, somebody who has asked Jesus to come into their heart and be their Savior and their Lord, somebody who wants to live uh, Christian values to their toward their neighbor. What we mean is is really a an uh, ethnocultural understanding of what Christianity is. It means people like us. It means our way of life, our cultures, our traditions. That is shaped by race. It's shaped by culture. It's shaped by class. Uh, and white Christian nationalists uh, want to see this fusion of American civic life with that kind of Christianity. It's not just about this generic understanding of Christianity. It's our Christianity, our way of life. And so it is both. It is both broader than just Christianity, but it's also more specific in that in that it means ours and 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 people like us. And I think this is where people can often uh, misunderstand what we're what we're talking about. I, I think we often hear the response, well, what about when African Americans, uh, motivated by their own religious faith, advocate for civil rights? Um, that is not Christian nationalism because these these groups of African Americans who are advocating civil rights and motivated by their faith are not trying to fuse. Uh, their understanding of Christianity with American politics and say that this country rightfully belongs to Christians, it always has and it always will be. They're advocating for, for justice and, and, and equality. Uh, white Americans who subscribe to Christian nationalism are advocating for something completely different. They're, they're, uh, they're advocating for a return to some nostalgic, mythical past where the right people, people like us, had power that's been taken away from them and they want to get it back. We were happy to work with the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty on this report on January 6th. And careful to point out, of course, as you agree, that you can't put, paint all Christians with the same brush, uh, not even all evangelicals. Some evangelicals did not vote for Trump. But, uh, but personally, I, I think you identify as a Christian yourself, so you, you're, you're, you're careful not to paint all Christians with the same, same brush also, right? Is evangelicalism a core, or is, an, uh, is it like an offshoot of the religion? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I think uh, it, 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 this is actually a contentious issue within the, the scholarship on religion, is, is has white evangelicalism always been uh, fundamentally shaped by its relationship to uh, white supremacy, uh, by Christian nationalism? Has that always been a core component of this, or is this something that has been, um, uh, that something that has taken uh, uh, twisted and 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 adjusted white evangelicalism to that to where that's all there is now, uh, white Christian nationalism and white supremacy and and uh, you know a neoliberal conservative ideology, um, and that's a really difficult thing to pinpoint. I will say empirically, I, I like that you said that, Dan, and I appreciate that. I think that uh, we do find, statistically speaking, that even though there is tremendous overlap between white evangelical identity and Christian nationalist ideology. The, the the Venn diagram has not become a full circle just yet. It, it may in the future, and it looks like it's moving towards that, unfortunately. Uh, and, and that will be, and that is that is actually coming from both sides. Some white, moderate white evangelicals are leaving. Well, what will happen and, to you if that happens? Yeah, <laughs> so I will I will probably find myself in the in the position of a of a lot of Americans who still identify with the Christian faith and and still feel uh, you know that that is a that is an identity that we are all wrestling with. What does that even mean now? I, I'm writing a book on, uh, on, on why we need the scientific study of religion now to help us understand the way this country is being shaped by religious activism and by polarized religion. Uh, and I, I find myself scratching my head about, you know, what do these terms even mean in a, in a situation where white evangelical just means religious Trump voter, <laughs> you know, or, or religious Trump supporter? That's, that's what it's becoming. And uh, or it means, you know, Christian right or staunch Christian nationalists. And so, uh, you know, I think these terms become uh, they're evolving and they're becoming more problematic to really pin down. Well, speaking of terms briefly, is there a difference between Christian nationalism and white Christian nationalism? Yes, I think so. I, you know, I think Christian nationalism that we are talking about usually is white Christian nationalism and, and that, that it. We, we, in our first book, uh, the one I wrote with Andrew Whitehead, Taking America Back for God, we really spoke about Christian nationalism in the most broad and generic terms. We talk about the racialized aspects of Christian nationalist ideology and how that, that usually is different for white Americans than for black Americans or racial minorities. In the flag and the cross, we, we try to be very specific that what we're talking about is white Christian nationalism, because within white Christian nationalism, the racialized understanding of what a Christian is and how what, what does Christian heritage mean? What do Christian values mean? What does a Christian nation look like? Uh, in, this, in this population, it's far more explicitly in, if not explicitly stated, it is implied that Christians are people like us, and we want to make sure that 
uh, people like us are are privileged and prioritized. So, for example, we find that Christian nationalist ideology is one of the leading predictors that white Americans themselves feel that they are the ones who receive the the the, the, the brunt of persecution these days. That they are the most persecuted, not just Christians, white Americans, just period. Uh, and and why is that the case? Well, it's because uh, to these white Americans, Christian implies whiteness. It implies it implies American. You know, Christian implies Americanness. But it also implies whiteness because it's all jumbled together in this kind of complex of identities. It just means people like us. And so that is correct. We try to differentiate between white Christian nationalism and something that is a bit more broad and difficult to, to pin down. Well, when we come back from this break, uh, Professor Samuel Perry, I want to talk a little bit about um, tracing the history of white Christian nationalism, which I think you contend goes back to the late 1600s, which is far earlier than many of us would imagine. So we'll be back in a minute to talk more about white Christian nationalism. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening. But the religious pushback is fierce, and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan. Lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. And welcome back to Free Thought Matters. We're continuing our conversation with Professor Samuel Perry, author, co-author of the book The Flag and the Cross, which is packed not just with history, but with a lot of current data. Your book draws, uh, Dr. Perry, on recently, previously unpublished data about the 2020 election, about COVID, democracy, violence, even the insurrection. Can you talk more about what's behind the growing Christian nationalist movement? So I think there's actually uh, two things going on. It's both good news and it's bad news. So uh, the bad news is that we see uh, a modest decline in the percentage of Americans who subscribe to, say, hardcore Christian nationalist belief. That's a that's a good thing. We, we see that. And Really, we can we can attribute that to several different factors. One is just demography working its magic and older cohorts of Americans who largely subscribe to Christian nationalism passing on and younger cohorts who no longer believe those those kinds of things. They are they are rising up. And so we see a, a, a slight decline in that. Another decline is actually, you know, we can take up some credit for this, maybe, is that as we start talking about Christian nationalism more and more as a negative thing, as people want to distance themselves from, then really Christian nationalism you know, maybe maybe seven or ten years ago, some Americans might have just thoughtlessly subscribed to these kinds of things because they just thought that's what it meant to be a good Christian or a good American. As we talk about Christian nationalism, though, and we talk about its dangers, I think more Americans may realize this is something I want to back away from. Uh, kind of like nobody wants to be called a racist. Nobody wants to identify with explicitly racist views, and so they're backing away. That's the good news. The bad news is. Uh, these Americans who do continue to subscribe to Christian nationalist ideology are now doing it very consciously. Uh, they, they, they know, they've heard about it, they've read about it, and they like it. <laughs> they, they affirm it. They, they are the true believers. And with that, they actually understand that, like, hey, people like us are being targeted as, like, the backwards uh, uh, right-wing reactionary people, and they're still embracing that identity. Uh, and, and with that becomes greater potential for radicalization, for greater militancy. Uh, and, and I also want to stress, and we have, we have seen this obviously the case this past summer, uh, that the small numbers belies uh, the actual influence within politics, uh, especially in the judiciary. But we see just because this group of people happens to be diminishing slowly in terms of their size does not mean that they uh, are not very politically active and very successful in their activism. I would also say that we, we also see, and this is, I think, social psychologists have demonstrated this recently with experimental data, Christian nationalist ideology ebbs and flows in response to perceptions of threat. 
So when you tell a bunch of white Christians, for example, that they're that that Christians are becoming the minority, that they're 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 they are no longer going to be the majority by 2050 or something like that, uh, they actually respond with greater Christian nationalism. Now, there's in other words, we see this kind of reflex, this circling the wagons reflex, to where when you tell white Christians that we are diminishing in number, they actually feel like, okay, I need to fight for uh, my cultural and political power position. Uh, again, and so all it takes is very, very savvy politicians who are good at whipping up a lot of fear and anger and resentment about Christianity being on the wane, and you can actually generate more Christian nationalism. So it's not a static thing; it can actually respond to it. So they're becoming more dangerous than the the smaller. The, it only takes one nut with a gun to create a lot of damage. So even though the group is shrinking, you're thinking they're even more dangerous now. I mean, I think that is inevitable. The inevitable consequence of of a smaller group becoming self conscious. Uh, and and potentially becoming more militant and radicalized. And this yeah. is also something that we are, uh, with group identity, with just research on group identity, social identity theory, and social psychology and sociology, we understand that as people become self-conscious groups about their own specific identity and group and their, their tribe, I don't mean that so negatively, but I just mean like when, the, when it becomes, this activates this kind of like uh, group psychology with identity, uh, you see a potential for uh, greater animosity without groups, uh, greater us versus them kind of thinking. And that is pure Christian nationalism. It is, it is pure us versus them. We must win, they must lose kind of thinking. It's not into cooperation. It's not into collaboration to solve common problems or unity. It's only into unity for the sake of defeating our enemies. And the more this group becomes self-consciously aware of like the fact that they are shrinking, the fact that they are persecuted in the sense that like people disapprove of their values, uh, they become potentially more radicalized. Well, I guess that doesn't happen to the free thought community somehow. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the nuns, the non-affiliated don't seem to have this radical, violent agenda, thankfully. But anyway, I, I want to skip to the, the conclusion of your book, in which you talk about avoiding the big one. And you compare yep. the San Andreas, you, you say that Christian nationalism is the San Andreas fault of American politics. And of course, we want to uh, avoid that big one. And what do you mean by that? And how can we avoid it? Well, I think just what we are, unfortunately, I, I have witnessed this past summer and are witnessing now, we, we see we are heading as a country towards a situation uh, in which you have a, a, an, a, a diminishing a percentage of the population, uh, uh, contrary to the to the vast majority of of American citizens, according to say uh, uh, all of our public opinion polls and those kinds of things, they are uh, exercising undue influence in politics and in the judiciary and exercising this influence. So you have a situation in which um, white conservative Christians understand that their population is shrinking, that they are dying off, that they are not reproducing as fast as they as as they are dying off. Uh, with that comes a difficult decision that they have to make. They can either change their views, which they don't want to do. They can die off and just continue to diminish in their own influence, or they can get increasingly comfortable with situations uh, of minoritarian rule. Uh, and that seems to be where we are headed. They don't want to die off. They don't want to change their views, but they do want to get more comfortable with minoritarian rule in which they can say, hey, this is about religious freedom, our own religious freedom. This is about, you know, they, I mean, using all of the buzzwords of, of uh, uh, to be able to do this kind of rhetorical judo where they, where they talk about religious freedom. But what they really mean, obviously, patently, is, is freedom for us to be able to control and, and to maintain that kind of influence, um, despite the fact that the majority of Americans disagree with them. And this is, I mean, we've seen this with uh, the Roe decision recently. Uh, with this discussion about same-sex marriage and overturning Oberfeld. Yeah. Uh, the vast majority of Americans, 70-plus percent of Americans support gay marriage, even 55 percent of Republicans support gay marriage. And yet, uh, if they get a chance, uh, this group of, of folks would gladly uh, overturn Oberfeld, would nullify gay marriages, would, would do that kind of thing. And for them to be comfortable with that kind of position, to where, yes, we supposedly live in a democracy, and yet we will decide the law and policy based on our own minority opinion uh, that is that is that is not based in any way in science, but is just based on how we interpret the Bible. I mean, that is the definition of, I think, a Christian nationalist position. Well, I would like to ask you whether you think we have Christian nationalists right now on the Supreme Court. 
I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure. I, I think there, there, are, there are indicators. I mean, I think none, none of these people have been given a survey and, and, and asked to affirm those kinds of things. I think you can only go by, by, you can be very, very clear about like who Christian nationalists have supported on the Supreme Court and who they would like to be and how these justices render their own decisions. And so whether or not they personally identify as Christian nationalists, they are very much writing the support of, of white Americans who subscribe to Christian nationalist ideology. And sometimes that's all it takes, right? So uh, Christian nationalism is, is both an ideology that I can embrace personally, but it's also a political strategy and it's, and it's, a, it's an ethno culture. So think about Trump. Trump is a great example of this. I don't think Donald Trump believes anything, right? Like I think, he, like cynically, I think Donald Trump believes in himself. He believes in money. He believes in fame. He believes in winning winners and losers. But I think it's questionable whether or not Trump has a sincere ideological bone in his body that is not just about 100 percent him. And yet he's able to leverage that ideology of white Christian nationalism in his rhetoric to, to stoke fear, to stoke anger, and to be able to manipulate populations to vote. Well, I think it was Napoleon way. who said religion is a great thing to control people. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, 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 it really is when you are able to, I mean, you know, I think I, even more recent, William Barr, I'm, as I'm writing a, a, a book now on, on, on how religion is used in the, the public square and our need to study it. Um, William Barr, I'm looking at all these speeches by William Barr recently and, and you know, at Notre Dame and the Federalist Society, and he's, he's talking about why religion is important. And, and, he's, and he's basically giving away the ball game. But religion is, is important. He says, you know, it's not necessarily important because it's true. <laughs> Uh, it's important because it's a good moral teacher, right? Like it, 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 it trains people. It, 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 it coordinates and and it and it, uh, it forms them into good moral citizens. What he means by that is it is it is it shapes people to to have the kind of values that we want them to have, and I think that's exactly what I think a you know a, a Christian nationalist position would argue for is we need religion. Is it true? I don't you know. Whatever. What, what we need it for, though, is we need it because it makes our society prosperous, because it reflects our values and our vision for what the kind of country we want to be in. Well, we had so many more questions, but we are out of time. We're going to have to oh. have you back, Samuel Perry. And thank Anytime. you so much for joining us. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's a privilege to be here. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters. I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.